Morning, everybody. Dr. Dillard here. Once again, we made it to week nine. Unbelievable. Well, we have week 10. We have one more week left, one more lecture after this, and you've made it through first quarter. Well, assuming you pass the test, that is. Anyway, here we go. Week nine. So let's let's review. Last week we had our midterm, so we didn't have any lecture. So let's review a little bit. So remember last week we started week three, which is called the embryonic period. And remember the first thing, remember at the start of week three, at the start of the embryonic period, we had a, a bilaminar disc. We had an epiblast and hypoblast, just two layers. And now we're going to convert that into a three-layer disc. But the cells of those three layers, we're also changing them into the germ layers. They're all stem cell-like, especially that, ep that epiblast layer. Um, but that's epiblast part of the bilaminar disc. So we're making the three germ layers that you touch any part on your body right now, it's, it was derived from one of, the, one of these three layers that we're going to form right now. But at the start, we have a bilaminar disc. The very first thing that happens is we said that some of the hypo or epiblast cells in the periphery, the nodal gene gets turned on. And that signals them somehow to come to the middle. And they migrate into the middle of the embryonic disc. Here's like an overhead view of the disc. Like if your Ant-Man were in the amniotic cavity looking at the back. And we have these we have these cells that have woken up here. And I have a picture, so I'm not going to draw a whole bunch of them. But nodal starts getting turned on here in these cells. Uh, and this is the caudal, the caudal end. Right? And these cells migrate, and, and we've talked about how they the cams have to detach. There's some other work that needs to be done before they can just migrate, because they're just they're, they're epithelial cells, so we have to detach them. And there's more to the story, but the bottom line, they start to pile up here in the middle. And they start to, as they pile up, they start to move forward. And that forms what's called a primitive streak. It goes about 50% goes about of the way. Uh, and yeah, that's the story. So epiblast cells will migrate in and start to form a primitive streak, which grows in a caudal to cranial direction. Watch out. I like that test question. I'll say primitive streak grows in a cranial to caudal direction. That's wrong. It, goes, it grows from the caudal region back here to the cranial region up here, as I just demonstrated. All right here's a little picture I just whipped up this morning. Uh, so you can see these cells have nodal turned on, and the other cells don't have nodal turned on, and, and we don't understand the full story to that. But these cells migrate into the midline and start to pile up and form a streak. And they keep piling up and go forward and forward and forward. Um, as, as the streak matures, you get a groove running down the middle of it, which is called the primitive groove. Uh, there's a primitive pit that forms in this mass of cells out here. This is the primitive node, and you have a primitive pit in the primitive node. Later on, we're going to have cells going through that primitive pit and through this primitive groove to actually not form the primitive streak because that's already formed. Uh, but more epiblast cells are going to migrate through. And they are going to make mesoderm and endoderm and a and a precordal plate uh, and cloacal membrane. So they're going to make a bunch of other stuff too. Oral pharyngeal membrane. All right. So here comes the germ layer. So as I just said, once the primitive streak is formed, these magical super stem cells, epiblast cells. They continue to migrate in, but the streak's already been built. But instead of forming the primitive streak, they migrate right through various portions of the primitive streak. And different portions of this streak, these cells that make up the primitive streak are inducers. They have the ability to flip the switches of cells diving down through them. 
and they manipulate the genes in these cells passing through. And by turning on certain genes, it tells the cells where to go and what to become. It's quite an amazing system, actually. All right, so after all is said and done, epiblast cells, which morph into, remember they morph into bottle cells, and then they morph into mesenchymal cells, um, they pass through the streak, and the first wave goes down and knocks out the old hypoblast cells, and the new cells convert back into an epithelium, and we call that the endoderm. More streaming epiblast cells stay in the middle, and they don't turn into mesoderm. They stay, or they don't turn into an epithelial tissue yet. They stay a mesenchymal tissue, and that new layer of mesenchymal tissue is called mesoderm. And then last but not least, after all the new layers are formed, the ectoderm cells, or the, the epiblast cells, we don't know exactly the full story of this, but they morph into ectoderm cells. So we just created our three germ layers, mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm. And boards and then tests and things like that, you, they love to know what native tissue, like you're studying in gross one anatomy and gross two anatomy, where did that tissue come from? Was it mesoderm, endoderm, ectoderm? That's really important uh, that you learn that stuff. The cl this first kind of introductory class, I'm not trying to cram everything in endocrine or embryology into one class. I want to give you the building blocks so you can understand where all this stuff comes from. You're still going to have to do a little prep work on your own to prepare for boards because we don't, I don't think any schools have a, a part two embryology, which they really should. It's a massive and a very complex subject, especially because you haven't had gross two anatomy yet. And I have to teach you some of that for so you to understand the embryology of gross two. Anyway. All right, so here's a cartoon, uh, that same sagittal view. So we have, we have epiblast cells going through different parts of the primitive streak. Uh, some have already uh, replaced the cell layer down here, so that's an endoderm layer. We have this layer filling up the mesoderm. We have some cells streaking forward. Uh, they're going to form the precordal plate, uh, as we'll see, and more stuff uh, as we get further into the story. Uh, but that will be the, the trilaminar disc has been created. And then finally, the last thing we talked about is the precordal plate where another wave, in fact, this is the slide I think I used, this wave of s cells goes forward and starts to pile up right here. These are AVE cells. Right there, we talked about them. Remember, they turn off nodal up here so the streak can't form. The cranial, this is cranial end up here. Yeah, but we get a precordal plate, which is very important, another control center. All right, talked about that, um, but I guess we'll talk about it a little bit more. So that wave creates the precordal plate. They pile up, uh, and the cells in the precordal plate have that funny sonic hedgehog gene turned on. And when cells pass through the precordal plate, uh, this gene has the ability to induce them to go up and form the brain. So sonic hedgehog induces mesenchymal cells passing through it to go up and form an important part of the brain the fore, called the forebrain. Okay, got it? All right, so let's see, what are we doing here? Looks like we formed the precordal plate. Oh, this is just showing you how they go up and form the precordal plate. It's usually underneath the anterior visceral endoderm. Um, and yeah, we get some mesoderm forming. Remember, this is a mid-sagittal cut. If we did a parasagittal cut, you would see the three layers. It would look like this everywhere. But in the mid, it would look three layers, one, two, three. But in a mid-sagittal cut, we, we don't have a mesoderm forming because we have cells streaking forward to form different things. All right, so I think this is new territory now, the oral pharyngeal and cloacal membranes, and we don't quite understand this whole story. The board the books and all the books are a big mess on this 
story, but let's talk about the cloacal membrane. This is going to become your, your anus and uh, some of the holes in that region, as we'll see. How it forms is not completely understood. Um, not a single author actually discussed the formation. I had to go into the research, and I found we don't really know, understand well how this is formed. So it's a little nebulous here. I'd, if I was writing board questions on this, I would definitely stay away from this because we really don't know. We know some facts about it, though, which I will give you. Um, but we know about the same time the precordal plate forms cranially, caudally another circulite, circular plate forms. Uh, and it forms really, and this is where it gets confusing, but it form, it looks like it forms between epiblast and hypoblast. I, I mean, it involves epiblast and hypoblast cells. And those fuse together. So one thing we do know uh, where this cloacal membrane forms, there's maybe a uh, an ectoderm and endoderm over the top and bottom of it, but there's no mesoderm. So it's only it's only a double layer structure. the The trilaminar disc is only bilaminar at the cloacal membrane, and the same goes for the oropharyngeal membrane we're going to talk about right now. So no me mesoderm in this region. So it's just cloacal membrane is a bilaminar plate made of ectoderm and endoderm. Okay, there's a picture of it. Let me make a little note here. All right, so that's what it looks like. There's our primitive streak, which would, would really should be coming back this way more. All right, so uh, what is it going to form? Who cares about this thing? Well, it's going to become the basically the anus, the opening to the gut, or the end of the gut tube, the end of the road, right? Fecal material comes out of that. It, it will also form the urethra and the vagina if you're a female. And these structures, we're not going to get to these formation of this, but this occurs about week seven. Uh, but you could say that the cloacal membrane will become the terminal end of the gut tube. We'll talk about the gut tube next time. Okay, the oropharyngeal membrane. It's similar to the cloacal membrane, only it forms up front. So about the same time the cloacal membrane forms, another cluster of cells forms at the cranial end. And we don't think they're not streaming cells. They don't stream forward. We're not exactly sure. It just kind of shows up. And it, it seems like it's just the ectoderm and the endoderm in that region morph together so hard that it squeezes out any mesoderm. Okay. And this is called the oropharyngeal membrane. It basically, it forms right above and slightly in front of the precordal plate. Okay, so here's the precordal plate. What precordal plate that was formed by streaming cells, remember? Um, so that is be yeah, that's in the middle layer. That's in between the mesoderm or between the endoderm and ectoderm. Uh, but the oropharyngeal membrane is just part of the ectoderm and endoderm. Okay, just like the cloacal membrane back here. Like the cloacal membrane, these cells fuse the ectoderm uh, and the hypoderm together. Hypoderm, um, epiblast and hypoblast, they, f they form the, fuse the ectoderm and endoderm together. Let me fix that one for your slides, that will be fixed. I was gonna say hypoderm, what the heck is hypoderm? 389 fix hypoderm, which is no such thing. Okay, but the same deal. No mesoderm can squeeze in there. Uh, so this is yet another bilaminar part of the trilaminar disc. So now we know two bilaminar portions of it, the trilaminar disc, the cloacal membrane and the oropharyngeal membrane. Okay. Uh, and this will become the mouth, the opening to the oral cavity, and it starts to form about the fourth week. 
So we could say this is the start. We could say the oropharyngeal membrane is the start of the foregut. Okay. Or you could say it's the start of the gut tube as well. Right? The gut tube is the entire foregut, midgut, hindgut. We'll get to that. Well, this is the gut tube. When we start folding, we're going to create a gut tube, which is your gut. We will get to that. Hopefully we'll get to that. We had a buy. We had a mess last week because of the holiday. All right. So, hooray. Gastrulation is now complete. Some authors, like our board book authors, say gastrulation is complete. Other authors say there's some more work to do. Uh, why do they say gastrulation is complete? Because we've formed two very important structures, the primitive streak and the trilaminar disc. The three germ layers and the primitive streak have been formed. Gastrulation is complete. But regardless, the third week is not complete. We have a lot of more stuff to do in this third week. All right, the mesoderm will almost immediately differentiate into a bunch of structures because it's mesenchymal, so it morphs into structures quickly. We haven't made the nodal cord yet or the neurotube, uh, but remember, for our testing purposes, the formation of the nodal cord, which is next, and then the formation of the neural tube, that's not part of gastrulation. Gastrulation is formation of the primitive streak which helps induce the formation of the three germ layers. Endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm. Got it? All right, so what happens to this primitive streak in the long one? We've created a beautiful primitive streak going down the dorsal surface of the trilaminar disc. What happens to it? Well, it starts to, about the week four. It starts to degenerate away. Uh, as it degenerates, it starts producing a nodal cord, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, so as it degenerates, it degenerates from the cranial direction to the caudal, the opposite of how it was formed. And as it degenerates, it spits out nodal cordal cells. So as it gets smaller, the nodal cord gets longer. Okay, by the end of the fourth week, the primitive streak is normally completely disappeared. It's not like we don't have any remnants of this normally. Uh, like with a nodal cord, the remnants become the nucleus propulsus. Uh, that's not true with this, though. It should completely disappear. In fact, if it doesn't disappear, you can get these crazy tumors called teratomas. So teratomas are filled with all sorts of tissue because they're considered germ layer tissue or germ cell tissues. Primitive streak gave, gives, has the power to give rise to ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Therefore, these tour, tumors could have endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm. But maybe those tissues have matured as the tumor uh, advanced. So maybe you have skin, you have hair in the tumor, you have teeth, you have heart cells in the tumor. They're crazy, crazy tumors. I think I have a slide on that coming. We do need to talk about the tail bud, though. We're not quite done with the primitive streak. Uh, so some authors, like Larson, says that the gastrulation ends once the tail bud is formed. Our board books don't say that. If your school is using Larson for their or their boards, uh, if you're, I don't know what country you are, but if Larson is one of the reference books for your board that you have to pass, uh, then your gastrulation would end with the formation of the tail bud. And uh, from the last little bit of degenerated primitive streak, it's almost like another primitive node has formed. So as the primitive streak is disappearing from cranial to caudal, the very place where it started has a mass. In fact, those cells start clumping as the rest of the streak disappears. And this clump of primitive streak at the caudalmost portion, that new mass of tissue is called the tail bud. The tail bud. So here's kind of the story. Um, this is a little bit, we got a neural plate forming and a nodal cord because we went ahead in time. We'll talk about those next week. Uh, but here's the primitive node. It's digressing backwards and backwards. And here the tail bud is formed almost like a primitive node right in front of the cloacal membrane. 
Okay, so as the streak regresses, the tail bud begins to form. We'll definitely talk about the nodal cord and neural plate next week. What does this tail bud do anyway? Uh, it's the main source of, of something called secondary neurulation. It's the main source of cells for this. And we'll talk about that next week so it'll make more sense. But next week we're going to form a neural tube. The neural tube is going to induce the formation of a neural plate. Neural tube is going to become your spinal cord and brain. So it's a really important structure, as we'll see. Um, but so the cells in the tail bud actually will end up forming the sacral and coccygeal neural tube. The rest of the neural tube is induced by the formation of the neural plate cells, which we're going to form next. The neural plate folds into a neural tube, but it wouldn't form down the sacral coccygeal region. So uh, it's this mass, it's the tail bud. There's no plate that forms the neural tube in the sacrum and coccygeal region. Instead, this tail bud gives rise to this part of the new, uh, the, the neural tube. And it, it also, the tail bud also therefore gives rise to sacral and coccygeal somites and neural crest cells. Neural crest cells are magical. They make so many, so many different things. Melanocytes that give your skin color. You have underneath your skin, you have these little cells called melanocytes. They look like little octopuses or octopi. Uh, and they're derived from neural crest cells. They're amazing, great migrating cells. And we'll talk about those soon. Sacrococcygeal teratoma. Uh, so... We talked about this, but let's really talk about it again. If the primitive streak fails to completely disappear like it's supposed to, any leftover primitive streak is tumorous, and it can develop a weird tumor. Sometimes it's no problem. You never know you have one, but they can get really big in some people. Super rare, rarer than Marfan syndrome. I don't like to talk about diseases that are rarer than Marfan's. Marfan's, the... Pop, people with Marfan's walking around in the population, about 0.1% population prevalence. This one's 0.003% uh, of the population have this. Uh, that's actually, this is an incident. So the population would be higher. It'd probably be like maybe 0.008 or something like that. But anyway, it's rare. But it's a crazy, crazy tumor. Uh, they're the ones that develop. They typically occur in the sacral coccygeal region because that's where uh, that's where this tissue fails to obliterate usually. Uh, and these are called sacral coccygeal teratomas, and those are by far the most common. Sorry, I can't give you a warning when gross pictures arise. A uh, pretty gross picture. There's some gross one I almost put in here, but I took it out because I, I don't want to spring it on you. There's some. Uh, Google sacral coccygeal teratoma and go under images and Google and you'll see some crazy looking tumors, huge. Uh, but these are considered germ cell tumors. I think they had, had that on the test last quarter and a lot of people missed it. Why, why would this be a germ cell tumor? Because the primitive streak is said to induce or help induce all three germ layers. Therefore, it's a germ cell tumor, right? And we talked about the tumor can be a hodgepodge of, of different structures, anywhere from epiblast or anywhere from ectoderm uh, to skin with hair on it to teeth to hair like on the top of your head here. They're crazy tumors. Okay. Uh, these are usually benign, but occasionally they can be malignant. And if it's malignant, it's very deadly type of uh, of cancer. So hopefully it won't be malignant. Um, they can grow enough to cause a small bowel obstruction. We just talked about that yesterday. Actually, there's a lecture on this Professor Doug's lecture page here. You can look at fifth quarter. We The start of the show was small bowel obstruction. And we'll talk about that more in fifth quarter. Uh, but, yeah, they can be a source of small bowel or urinary 
uh, compression, obstruction, instruction. Let me make a note to fix that. Uh, let's see. This is. 398 fix instruction no obstruction uh, if they grow big enough of course much more common in females in fact 80 percent of these sacrococcygeal teratomas occur in females and when they get big like that they have to be surgically removed that one's not too big but there, there might be some intestine in there uh, and the sacrum might be malformed. There's, they're complicated. Notice the Franz beard. See the hairy patch here? It's, don't ever adjust anybody without an x-ray if they have a hairy patch here because that usually means they have some type of malformation underneath and it may not be stable. So be careful. Franz beards are these hairy patches here. you got to have an x-ray of those people, in my opinion. These are my opinions. This... My opinions and the school's opinions sometimes differ. Uh, let's see. Talked about that. Oh, sorry. Didn't be able to warn you. There's a one that's much more severe. The baby did survive from this. Didn't pass away, but major surgery was needed to remove that. But look at all the crazy different tissues that are in this uh, sacrococcygeal teratoma. How come this happened? Because the primitive streak didn't degenerate. The genes that caused degeneration didn't get turned on. Maybe the mom went out partying at week four. She didn't even know she was pregnant yet. That's the trouble. A lot of these teratinogens, uh, they strike before the female even knows she's pregnant. All right, some overlap. So this neurulation story we just talked about, there is an overlap with gastrulation, uh, with mesoderm differentiation, with so much. We got all these things kind of uh, happening at the same time. Neurulation story? We are not talking about neurulation yet. Um, probably take that out of there too, 400. Not sure why neurulation. Neurulation is what we're going to talk about next. Maybe the slide is out of place. Because um, we're going to form the nodal cord. Is, that's not really part of neurulation. But I think it's better to say this. The formation of the nodal cord story I'm about to tell you. There's a lot of stuff going on. Mesoderm is still differentiating. Sometimes gastrulation hasn't finished yet. Somites could be differentiating in some part. And mesoderm differentiation in other part. So a lot of these stories can be going on. So here's what we've developed so far. So this is a cut through the midline. We can still see the primitive streak, but we made a cloacal membrane. We made an oropharyngeal membrane back here. Uh, we have ectoderm. We have endoderm here, germ layers. Because this is a mid-sagittal cut, we don't see a lot of mesoderm. But back here, we can still see some mesoderm forming. So we got a three-layer disc. Now, the only thing we're missing is, let's see, let's make it pink. We're missing the notochord. The notochord is now going to form just like this, just like the precordal plate cells migrated forward in the midline. Notochord is going to do exactly the same thing, and there are going to be more cells coming through here. Some genes are turned on, and it's going to form the super important notochord. So that's where we're going. It's just a blow up of that. All right, formation of the notochord. Here's what we're going to build, which I just kind of drew right in there. How do we build it? So there's several steps. The first thing we have to do is we have to build kind of a baby nodal cord. That's called a definitive nodal cord. It doesn't work yet. It doesn't turn any. It doesn't indu induce the formation of the neural plate. It's just a baby. Uh, so that's the definitive nodal cord. Um, well, no, let me take that back. The definitive, that's the mature nodal cord. We're building the definitive nodal cord. 
Okay, so note accord, definitive note accord means we're done. We've already went through the hollowing out process and this whole nine yards we're going to talk about right now. So that's definitive nodal cord is the mature nodal cord. Nodal cord is a cord-like structure that develops between ectoderm and endoderm in the midline. So in a mid-sagittal cut, you'll see it. In a parasagittal cut, you won't see it. Uh, we're still in week three. It takes about six days to form this, usually... Uh, between day 16 and day 22, so it could push over into week four. This structure, just like the primitive streak, is not a permanent structure. It will degenerate away. Most of it will degenerate away. Some of it goes on to form the nucleus propulsus of the inner vertebral disc. I like that question. It's found in all vertebrates. In fact, all vertebrates are members of the phylum chordate. That's kind of like cord, chordate, cord. See the cord there? So yeah, we all had notochords. Extends from the primitive node to the precordal plate. Uh, it grows caudally. It initially, I mean, you could, this is a weird one. I would stay away from this if I was writing board questions because when it first starts out, it actually grows caudal to cranial until it bumps in to that precordal plate. But then as it bumps into the precordal plate and is mature, the nodal or the primitive streak starts regressing and degenerating backwards. And as it goes backwards, precordal or as the pre uh, primitive streak degenerates backwards, it keeps spitting cells out forwards. So you could say it grows caudally at that point, but that's the tricky question. So, um, oh, I got to go on my rant here. What a mess! Trying to put—I don't know how many days I spent trying to put this story together. I've read so many books. The authors are all over. Terrible job telling the story. Two chiropractic books, Moore's and Langman, conflict with each other. Uh, it's just an absolute mess. Singh and Larson were in harmony and very good at telling the story. So they saved the day on this. So shame, shame. Game of Thrones, right? Basic functions. What does this thing do anyway? This Well, it's, it's like a little, little spine really at first because the embryo is starting to grow and get heavy and it's, it needs some central support, and so it does provide a, a temporary axial support until it can help induce the formation of the neural plate, which forms the neural tube, which is going to form the spine. So it's like a temporary spine, you can think of it as. Uh, it also induces the formation of the uh, neural plate, which forms goes on to form the neural tube. It induces the formation of vertebral bodies. How does it do that? Because it forms the neural tube. And as we said, it does some of its remnants normally form the nucleus propulsus of the invertebral disc. They're around till about the age of 10, and then it's completely gone. And yeah. And we're experts on this now, right? Nucleus propulsus, annulus fibrosis, there's the lamellae. Didn't show the vertebral end plate, cartilaginous end plate would be there as well. But nucleus propulsus. What's the basic function? So uh, did I do that? Yeah, I went the wrong way, I think. So let's make this let's make this nodal cord. So the very first thing we have to make is a notochordal process. Sorry, got the garbage trucks coming. Should we try to lecture over the garbage trucks? Let's see how crazy it gets. Um, yeah, so the first thing is to make the notochordal process. Uh, a second wave, another wave of migrating cells uh, migrates forward and it makes something called the notochordal process. I kind of drew it already. Remember the first wave of midline migrating cells forms the um, they form the precordal plate. 
this second wave is going to form the nodal cortical process. Okay, mesoderm and endoderm are still forming at this point. So it's a narrow beam of cells. We kind of drew it already for you. It's between the ectoderm and endoderm. It piles up. It gets blocked. These migrating cells get blocked at the precordal plate. And yeah, this is called the, some call it the head books, more of the European books call it the head, the head book, the head process, but everybody else calls it the notochordal process. So here we have this, the primitive streak here, and we have cells spitting going forward, uh, cells migrating still, and they go forward and form this process. Right, there's just another picture of it. Pretty much everything we said, cells streaming through, forming this notochordal process. Okay, there are some genes that are involved in this. Uh, so in order to, for these epiblast cells, or th these epiblast cells that are migrating, they have to have two genes switched on uh, to become a notochordal process cell. And so we know the FOXA2 gene, which is for Fox head box transcription factor. Um, we're just going to call it FOXA2 if it's okay with you. Uh, so these genes have to be turned on in cells. Um, these are turned on before they even pass through. And, and these, are, these are epiblast cells still uh, that are turned on. And these epiblasts won't go, they won't form mesoderm or endoderm. Um, they're they're, the, if these genes get turned on, they're going to go form this notochordal process. Uh, the brachiary gene also has on. Sometimes that's older research calls that the T gene, uh, but the brachiary gene also. This one protects these cells when they pass through the primitive node. All right, how about elongation of the nodal cord process? Uh, we already said this, as it as the nodal cord reaches its full length, primitive streak starts regressing, going backwards, and we said that it keeps spitting out our nodal cordal cells as it regresses. And therefore, at this point, you could say that the nodal cord elongates uh, from a cranial to caudal direction, but I think that's really confusing. Because as I said, when the nodal cord first starts forming, it's the opposite. It elongates from caudal to cranial earlier, earlier on. Sorry about the garbage truck again. Decided to go right through the garbage truck. Uh, let's see. Yep. Yeah. So here, nodal cordal process is nicely formed, and primitive streak is regressing so as as the primitive streak is pulling back so the primitive node should be moving that way backwards cells keep getting spit out right so it's elongating in that direction so now we go through a hollowing out type phase so meet the nodal cordal uh, canal so we have a solid nodal cortical process. The next step, it becomes hollow. And we don't, I'm not going to go through the mechanism of that because they don't really understand why. But it's very short-lived. So it becomes hollow. So it does create a nodal cortical canal uh, which connects to the primitive pit. Right? And what is this up here? What's this space up here? Amnion. Right? That's the amniotic cavity filled with amniotic fluid. What's the space down here? Secondary yolk sac. Right, So that's filled with a yolk fluid like stuff as well. So now we have amnion running down here. And that's probably got to do 
this form this has to do with something that they haven't figured out yet okay next the fusing the notochordal process is going to fuse with the ectoderm or with the endoderm underneath uh, so this is going to well let me show you i think i have a picture yeah there we go yeah so it dropped down and we kind of got uh, we've got a disappearance of that bottom layer it's fused solidly to that okay these cells what happened to these cells here they disappeared because some of this is going to disappear in a minute but that's kind of the, the fusion of these two together okay now a weird hole is going to form we got to talk about this neuronteric canal uh, relatively short-lived but it is going to allow for a communication so let's see what happens uh, so in a small region where the notochordal process has fused with the endoderm layer uh, remember I said that bottom layer of notochordal process degenerated and some of the degeneration affects the endoderm and you get a hole formed and once there's a hole see how that's formed here we got a hole here and the endoderm has been degenerated away and now we have a communication between amniotic fluid and this yolk sac fluid and uh, maybe there's some genes that are turned on by this flow of fluid that we don't understand there's got to be something about this that we don't understand but they don't understand it yet um, but we do know that this happens and it's short-lived because now we're going to repair that hole um, but we also know malformation if this canal stays open permanently uh, or other malformations can lead to uh, something called diastematomyelia uh, that is the split spinal cord most people have one these people have a split cord and they can have syrinxes they can have all kinds of neurological problems because of this because of diastematomyelia or, or diastemomyelia is another word to say it all right that means people that means two cords they have two spinal cords i do like the pathology right here's an i should have put it i think we've seen enough axial images to know this is very weird looking right there should be of course one spinal cord here about this shape and solid thecal sac and cerebral spinal fluid around it it's a t2 weighted image so that is definitely quite strange all right, so now we have the notochordal plate is next up. Uh, so next, the entire notochordal process is going to smash to the bottom, maybe to help fill that hole. They don't know why, but it drops down, and our cord is now flat as a pancake, and it temporarily becomes the notochordal plate. Right? So we went with a solid structure to a tube, to a tube with a hole in it, and now everything has collapsed to form a plate, which is going to, to close off that neuronteric canal. Okay, so here's the cartoon. Everything is smashed down here, and now we have a notochordal plate covering the hole. No more, uh, no more canal. Okay. Now this plate, these cells are going to start growing again. They're going to start growing kind of out of the plane of the page right at us and into the plane of the page on the other side. And the sides are going to curl up. And guess what? They're going to make another tube again. So we went from a solid structure to a tube. Then we had a hole in the tube. Then the tube flattened out into a plate. And now it grew into a tube again. And there's reasons for all this that we don't understand yet because if you mess this this system up um, the it'll the fetus will be non-viable and won't make it or have horrible defects so this is all important so here's the whole there's the collapsing of the top uh, and then these guys are growing up like this the neural the endoderm is actually growing back as well um, but yep that reforms the uh, hollow notochord the notochordal canal and then we're we're right back to where we started crazy right there's the notochordal process which doesn't do anything 
you have to go through this entire process to form exactly the same thing, but it's not. These cells have tremendous stem cell potential, and they, um, they have the ability to induce many functions. And these cells have the ability to release juices, which we'll see, that will soak up and start to create a neural plate. The notochordal process can't do that, but these cells can. So there's something about this process that turns on a whole bunch of genes to give us a definitive notochord. Right? Everything I said, that very last step, it detaches, so it's not attached to the ectoderm or the endoderm. It's kind of free-floating. And yeah, there's our definitive notochord. And awesome. Okay, there is some notochordal pathology. We've got to talk about that. So remember we said that the notochord eventually degenerates away, except for a little bit. And that little bit gives rise to the nucleus propulsus. Okay, so when you are born up to about the age of 10, the cells in your nucleus propulsus are really notochordal cells. However, something really weird happens. At the age of 10, they start dying off. And then they're replaced by a new kind of a fibroblast type cell that you have inside your disc right now. Okay, so that's weird. Um, and the theory of annular tears, why some are painful and why some are not painful, has to do with this. So the theory is, one theory, is that when the body's immune system is forming, it makes a checklist and it checks off self, checks off your own tissue, like your heart forms, check. Because you, you don't want your immune system to attack good tissue, right? You want your immune system to attack viruses, things like that. Okay, so it makes a checklist as you're developing. And when it looks at the disc, it sees annulus fibrosis cells, check. And it sees, oh, notochordal cells. Okay, check. But they die off, and at age 10, you have a new cell type in there that your immune system has never seen. We've learned that there's no blood supply inside the nucleus propulsus, right? So how can your immune system know who they are? And if you don't get a tear in your disc, no big deal. But if you get a tear in your disc in those new nucleus propulsus cells that the immune system has never seen, if they get out to the outer portion of the disc where the nerves and the blood vessels are, well, you might get an uh, almost an autoimmune type attack. The body may see this tissue because the, the immune system circulates in the blood looking, and it might not know who it is, and it's causing the troops, and now you've got a wicked inflammation, and yeah, that's going to cause pain, right? You have to have inflammation to have pain with regard to discogenic or any type of pain in your back. It's got to be an inflammation. So that's kind of everything I said. The cells are replaced with fibroblast, kind of mesodermal cells. Um, these new cells may be antigenic. Make sure you know what that is. Antigenic means that's like a foreign type cell. The body's um, antibodies will be made. And you, antigenic cell is, is not known by the body. Could be a virus, could be a bacteria could be a foreign piece of material, foreign liver, foreign kidney. Anything your body doesn't know is antigenic and will be attacked. Antibodies will be produced to attack this thing, amongst other mechanisms. Okay, so a little back pain. So everything I just said a second ago, a uh, very painful inflammatory process could ensue if you get an annular tear. Uh, and we've already said a couple times, discogenic low back pain, number one cause of chronic low back pain. All right, so here's our little cartoon. There's our nucleus propulsus cells. And here's a healthy annulus. Remember, the blood vessels and the nerves are only in the outside layer here. Here comes our garbage truck again, back to torture us. I'm sure you've got to be able to hear that, right? doesn't bother me as much as those leaf blowers and oh my god those things just drive me crazy anyway 
So here's an annular tear, and now we've leaked the nucleus propulsa cells out, and they've caused a wicked inflammation here. Uh, I didn't draw the nerves in there, but that's the theory of discogenic low back pain right there. Tear within the annulus fibrosis and a leaking of these uh, causes this inflammation. All right. How can you see an annular tear as the garbage truck drives away? So we'll have quiet for a while. So you can't see them on x-ray. You can't even see them on MRI. You certainly can't see it on CAT scan. Sometimes you can see a high-intensity zone, it's called, give you a hint that it's there. We've probably looked at those. Uh, but the test that you order if you suspect discogenic pain, and you never want to order this test unless the patient is severely disabled, over 50% on the oswestry, and he's been that way for at least six months. Because this test will ruin the disc. There's good research from Stanford. Kerrigy did work on that. We talk, I've already talked about how bad it is. Stem cell therapy, same thing. You can puncture a hole in the disc, you're going to doom that disc. Uh, you get a greater chance within the next five years of having a herniation, annular tear because of that needle stick. But anyway, so you put a needle in there and you fill it up with contrast. And is this a normal looking nucleus? Absolutely. Right, the nucleus pulposus is filling, but the annulus is not filling. That's a typical pattern. Yeah, it's great. How about this one? So, a client of mine a couple of years ago had a CT discography we had to order to confirm the diagnosis of symptomatic annular tear. When they pump this disc up right here, this is the L3 disc, horrible, horrible packed pain, pain down into the thigh, uh, which was the problematic symptoms. So that lended support to the theory that this was the mainly the symptomatic disc and the patient had inner body fusion after chiropractic and all other treatments failed. Um, but yeah, so you can see here's the nucleus, right? We got this disc is shredded. We got a huge rip this way. And we got, if this is not cooperating, but remember this is three-dimensional. See how this goes up? So we just got a slice going through it like that so we don't see it. But it's a shear paper, grade five, grade 5 annular tear there. Then another one up at 4. Look at this one. This one's leaking. See how it's leaking in the back? This one leak contrast right out. That's calcium in the aorta right there. That's Monkberg's medial sclerosis. All right. So yeah, that's called discogenic pain. What's the test for discogenic pain? Provocative discography. All right, what if a big portion, though, of this notochord doesn't degenerate away? Oh yeah, we got more pathology. Uh, this is called a cordoba, cordoma. Uh, it's rare. Look at the incidence on this one. But I got to bring it because it's a. I mean, it's they're gonna they're gonna ask you what a notochordal tumor is, or what what could form from remnant of notochord. High yield board question here. Uh, so this is a chordoma. It's cancerous. And it occurs because of the remnants of the notochord. Prevalence is 0 0.0001, so it's quite rare. Uh, but for malignant bone tumors, it counts to about 2% of all malignant bone tumors are a chordoma. Uh, it arises from the spine only. Okay, so it has to be a bone tumor in the vertebrae. And uh, they're found typically in the cranial or sacral regions only. Typically shows up at about 50 years of age. Half are in the sacrum, half are cranial. It loves to invade soft tissue. Uh, so these can metastasize. 40% of the tumors metastasize, get into the lymph system, and they can go to the brain. They can go anywhere. A really bad prognosis when that's stage 4 carcinoma of any cancer. It gets into the bloodstream and it's off to the races. Uh, cranial region. Uh, these tumors have been confused with nasal polyps. I used to have a picture, but it's too. I think it's getting too complicated for you took that stuff out uh, can easily be confused with a nasal polyp 
Left a couple MRI pictures in here, though, because you look at MRI all the time. There's an L5 disc. How's that disc look? Young person, too. It's nice and white on this T2 weighted. It's like a 30-year-old. Okay, that's normal. You can see one. There's S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. There's the coccyx. How's this one look? Oh, it doesn't look good, does it? S1, S2, and boom. That's a sacral coccygeal cordoma. Cordoma, doma, cordoma. How about this? Maybe this is your 3 o'clock patient. You're in a hurry. You want to go play golf. Associate brings the x-ray to you. I got this one, Doc. Go play golf. Can I treat? You always check your associates. Make sure their radiographic skills are up to snuff because this guy was not up to snuff. Is this it? What's that black stuff? It's gas. How do I know it's gas? Sacroala. Here's the sacroala here. So this black thing is outside. It's not, if it was only in bone, I'd be worried. But it's it's clearly gas. What's this thing? Birth control. See anything else wrong? Where's the rest of the sacrum? Oh, but isn't that just fecal material? No. Where's the sacrum? You should be able to see the cord. It's completely chewed away by this. Uh, so that's a cordoma. No good. All right. I think that's enough. I was debating to power ahead, but I think that's your only first quarter. I think we've given you enough slides. So, all right. See you all later.